Okay, are you ready? Today's study tip says, the bridging game. For each chapter, write new terms on a small slip of paper. For example, membrane, enzyme, protein. Put all the slips in a box, mix them up, and draw out two of them at a time. Then, try to build a bridge of ideas between the two terms. So, I know that you don't want to go back and do membrane, enzyme, protein, but today you could all kinds of hormones, names of hormones, where they're made, and see if you can make connections between them. This is, is what's going to make the difference between an A and a B in the class, definitely. Being able to make connections between terms and things that are, don't seem totally related, uh, if you can relate them, that means you have a really good understanding. All right, chapter 11, part two. Last time we did second messenger system. We learned about um, different types of hormones. We're kind of general in how you know the uh, receptors work and things like that. Today we are doing specific names of hormones. You need to know the name, where it's made, its target, and what it does when it gets to the target. And there are about 20 of them today. Now your book has a longer list. I don't expect you to know all those. You can, of course, look at them and read them. You might be interested in them. But today, you're going to have plenty to do just from the lecture. All right? So first of all, to remind you about the anatomy, we always start with our anatomy review. Here is the hypothalamus. And there are our hormones made here that are stored in the posterior pituitary. And in the front here, anterior pituitary, there are six hormones we're going to learn about. But these two, made um, in the hypothalamus, stored in the posterior pituitary, are ADH and oxytocin. And so it says produced here, ADH and oxytocin produced here, and released here. Okay, and they go into the bloodstream. So remember, we're doing hormones, right? So the two hormones from the posterior pituitary are antidiuretic hormones. So let's, before we read there, what do we think a diuretic does? What is a diuretic? If you have a diuretic, what does it make you do? Makes you go pee, right? Makes you increase urine output. So what does an anti-diuretic do? It decreases urine volume. Yeah, right. So, but if you decrease urine volume, urine volume is really about keeping the blood happy. So if urine volume goes down, what happens to blood volume? it goes up right now blood is going to be a big part of about three or four lectures coming up soon so we'll start learning that stuff now with ADH okay so it decreases the water in the urine and it stimulates the kidney cells to reabsorb water so that's how it does that's its target okay the kidney cells and when we get to the renal system we're going to learn details about how it's going to do that second oxytocin Name brand of this one, Pitocin. Have you ever heard of a woman getting Pitocin? Why would she get that? Do you know? So she's she's not having strong enough contractions. Her labor's not going forward. She's pregnant and not being able to deliver the baby. Or they go, you know what? Today's the day. We need that baby out. Uh, you're having high blood pressure or whatever the problem is. Baby's not doing well. They give her a shot of Pitocin and that will start contractions of the uterus to get the baby out. So Oxytocin is the one that the brain makes, and it stimulates contraction of the uterus muscle. Technically, do you remember the layer of the uterus that is muscle? It's called the myometrium. Mm -hmm. There's your anatomy. And, uh, of course, after the baby is born, it stimulates milk let down from the breast. So there are muscles there also to squeeze out the milk for the baby to drink. So those are the two. The anterior pituitary makes six that we need to know. First of all, also related to pregnant women, is the first one called, I'm going to start on the left here, prolactin. Prolactin, lact mean, comes from the word, what word? Lactose, right, which is milk sugar. So prolactin um, also is, go is going to um, signal the production of milk in the mammary glands. Then we have growth hormone. Growth hormone tells your body to do what? To grow, yeah. And it has, you have receptors on adipose, muscle, and bone 
for growth hormone. Of course, as you get older, I think we mentioned this, the, the, you don't have those receptors anymore, so the growth hormone's not going to work. Um, gonadotropins go, are, are going to go to the gonads, right? And so that's the ovaries and the testes. The first one is called FSH. It stands for follicle stimulating hormone. It was first discovered in the female, and it uh, stimulates the follicles of the of the ovary. But of course, should have known. There's a similar thing for the testes, but they didn't change the name. So even men have FSH, even though it's called follicle stimulating hormone. The fourth one is LH stands for luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone is involved with the corpus luteum from the ovary. Do you remember that word? Excuse me, why don't I take a drink? And for the for the men, they also have luteinizing hormone, even though the name didn't change. Next on the list is adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH. Do you see how they abbreviate these things? Because they're so long. Adrenocorticotropic hormone released from the anterior pituitary goes to the adrenal cortex. Yes, that's why it's... So where's the cortex? The inside or the outside? This is the medulla. This is the cortex, the outside. Mm -hmm. So, and we'll talk about what it does when it gets there. Uh, TSH stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. You should know this one from doing the uh, Physio X on the rats. Okay, TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, stimulates the thyroid. Okay, so you, this six hormones, you need to know their name, where they're made, here they're made, uh, what they do and what they do when they get there. First, thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH. Now on the test, you're going to write thyroid stimulating hormone, okay, then you can put TSH. Um, it stimulates a thyroid to release its hormones and we will discuss those hormones in a few minutes. Second, adrenocorticotropic, try saying that, try saying adrenocortico. Now try saying adrenocorticotropic. Adrenocorticotropic hormone Yes, yeah, so this stimulates the adrenal cortex to release cortisol, and cortisol, again, from the word cortex, okay? And you know cortisol, hydrocortisone, all that stuff for inflammation. We'll talk about that in a minute. Number three, follicle-stimulating hormone, FSH, um, tells the ovaries to signal egg maturation. Technically, we don't have eggs. I don't know why I wrote egg. We're not chickens. Ova maturation, and the testes to signal sperm production. Luteinizing hormone tells the uh, ovarian follicles to ovulate the egg and the testes to produce testosterone. Those will cover a lot more when we get to reproductive at the end of the semester. Growth hormone tells um, the liver to produce somatomedins, which are for growth. Soma, what's soma mean? Soma means body, right? So to grow the body. Uh, growth hormone tells bone and soft tissue to grow. And then there's these stories, they're not diseases, but they're, you know, medical conditions. Um, one is about, you know, the really tall people, the giants, yeah, and then the little small people that are like 14 inches tall, uh, dwarfism. Those are real things. They do happen. I am a big fan of that Ripley's Believe It or Not place. You know, and there's one in uh, Fisherman's Wharf. I love that place. I love the freaky stories. And it those things are true. And so, you know, many years ago before we had the internet and TV and, and even newspapers, heck, people didn't believe all these things. But, you know, the body does weird things. And if cells are not dividing correctly or there's a, a, a growth or a cancer or a tumor or something, this could easily happen. So gigantism and dwarfism are usually pituitary gland tumors, so the growing inside the brain on the, as it, with a tumor. So you really don't see a lot of these stories these days because people get help. They, you do see them more in foreign countries where you know, they're afraid to go to the doctor, they don't have a doctor, they have no money to see the doctor, and so there's a you know, 14-inch child who should have been taken care of, and this, this can easily be prevented. So if kids are not growing, doctors notice. That's why you take your kid to the pediatrician for checkups, and they can see. 
And now, if you're short people, and uh, you have short parents, right? But if, if your parents are tall and you're short as a seven-year-old, eight-year-old, nine-year-old, they might consider giving shots of growth hormone. Oh, shots. Yeah, how do you take it? As a pill or a shot? Take it as a shot. Mm -hmm. And it's painful. I, I have a friend whose son gets growth hormone shots and, and she says it hurts quite a bit. Number six, prolactin, breast development, milk production, prolactin. So a couple of these you only see in pregnant women. All right, next. To control the anterior pituitary, it's actually the hypothalamus that does it. So the hypothalamus makes um, what we call neurosecretory neurons. So here it's going to make hormones that come down and control um, these green dots here, releasing hormones. Okay, so from these neurons coming down, there are neurotransmitters that come through here and tell these what to do. So really, uh, the hypothalamus we say is the boss, the master gland, because they make the two hormones for the posterior pituitary and they actually control the six from the anterior pituitary. So the role of the hypothalamus are the neurosecretory neurons are there, your book has a whole list of all the names. They are stored in the posterior pituitary and then there are releasing hormones. These command the anterior pituitary to release or maybe inhibit one of its six hormones. And it's often called the master gland. Okay, this is a story about negative feedback. So all these hormones stay in balance all day long because of negative feedback. So here the hypothalamus makes a hormone that we saw in the rat lab called thyrotropin releasing hormone, TRH. Thyrotropin releasing hormone just goes down to the anterior pituitary, not very far, and it says, okay, you release TSH, all right, and the TSH goes to the thyroid, the thyroid releases thyroxine, and eventually it gets too high, thyroxine gets too high, and so there's a negative feedback to say, shut it down, our thyroxine is too high. And of course, you get growth of the thyroid, right? When you turn on the thyroid with the TSH. Then, when there's not enough thyroxine, this negative feedback loop stops and it goes back up again. So, it's a perfect example of the homeostasis we talked about on the first day. Okay, so now we're going to go to the names of the hormones of the adrenal gland. So here's orienting you, right? Kidney, adrenal gland on top. If you dissect it, I don't know. I had I taught students in, this in anatomy. I don't know if you had to learn this. It's connective tissue on the outside, zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, zona reticularis, adrenal medulla. I'll just need you to know cortex here, okay? Cortex and medulla. The adrenal cortex hormones are steroid hormones. So ding, ding, that tells you that you know the mechanism of action, right? So there's not going to bind to a receptor on the plasma membrane. It's going to instead be transported through the blood, slip right through. These are all things you learned last time. It's going to bind to its receptor inside, dimerize. Remember all that? Okay, so the first one is called mineralocorticoid. Try saying mineralocorticoid. The example is aldosterone. Aldosterone is going to be your friend in two weeks. Okay, because we're going to talk a lot about aldosterone when we do blood because it controls the salt concentration in blood. Okay, aldosterone. Second, glucocorticoids. The example of this is cortisol. This is involved in gluconeogenesis and anti-inflammation. So you know cortisol is anti and hydrocortisone like if you get a rash, right? You get a hydrocortisone cream, you put it on, and it's involved in anti-inflammation. But they are also involved in making of new gluconeogenesis, the making of new sugars. If you think of this, this is total fight or flight response, right? If you are running from the bear, you cannot have inflammation, right? Because there's no time for any pain and swelling. You're running. And because you're running, you need to make ATP, and so you need to make new sugars. Okay, so cortisol is involved in our fight or flight response. Number three, the adrenal cortex makes androgens and estrogens. So men, androgens and estrogens both are made there. 
okay? But, of course, men make tons of androgens, androgens like testosterone. Andro means male, estro means female. There are different kinds of androgens, one of them is testosterone. Different kinds of estrogens, one of them is called um, estradiol, you may have heard of that. But in the men, of course, the testes make tons more. Um, the females have androgens and estrogens also, same from their adrenal cortex, but of course they make most of their estrogens in the ovaries. Next, adrenal medulla. The adrenal medulla makes epinephrine. Its common term is adrenaline, but we're not going to call it that. It's like saying spit instead of saliva, right? We've been through this. The real term that you need to know is epinephrine, and it makes a very similar product called norepinephrine. And their actions of these two hormones, and by the way, they are not steroid hormones. They are amine hormones. So we learned last time different method for action, okay? They're both going to do things just like the sympathetic nervous system. So they're going to increase the heart rate, increase cardiac output, vasodilate, increase mental alertness, and increase metabolic rate. So I'm sure you already know epinephrine, those, those kinds of things. Next, fun fact. Some people believe that they are addicted to their own adrenaline and choose to live with stress in their jobs, relationships, and finances. There is a support group called AAA for them, Adrenaline Addicts Anonymous. I don't know. I get this stuff from the internet. I don't know if you can believe all my fun facts. But yeah, don't you know those friends? The drama queen, yeah? Like really? Just relax. Okay. Thyroid gland. There it is. Can you find yours? Right underneath the thyroid cartilage, it's the thyroid gland. It makes two hormones you need to know. One called um, triiodothyronine on the bottom. Triiodothyronine. Say triiodothyronine. <clears throat> so the tri means three. Yeah iodine, iodothyronine. So, and then the fourth one is tetraiodothyronine, but you learned it in the physioex as thyroxine. Okay, so they give it a short name, thyroxine. Still a long word, but one, two, three, four iodines. That's the difference. Okay, so these are going to be made in the thyroid um, gland, important for metabolism, things like that. So the Signal to make it comes, as we just said, from TSH, from the anterior pituitary. Signals its production. They are synthesized, that means they're made, by the follicular cells of the thyroid. Alright? Follicular cells. You should know that from anatomy. If you don't, look it up. Made from iodine and tyrosine. So it's made from the amino acid tyrosine. So this is important to get iodine in our diet. Important to have tyrosine. So that means proteins. Now, long time ago, people did not eat well, and they started putting iodine in our. What did they put? What did the federal government put iodine in? In our salt, right? There's no need to have that now. There's no need to have iodine in our salt. Okay, but they still do it. People still buy it, thinking that they need to have it. The government has also felt free to give us other things, like um, in milk. What do they put in the milk? They put vitamin D in the milk. There's no need for that either. If you eat normal diet, not even like super healthy, just normal diet, we don't need it. And of course, vitamin D, you get, you know, you need to sit in the sun, right? You need to get some sunshine. Um, another one recently. In flour, do you know what they're putting in flour? They're putting folic acid in flour because um, it folic acid is is very important to have in your diet if you're pregnant and just like with an embryo that just is brand new, embryo fetus, important for neural development. So the government said, oh, you know what? Here, everyone gets um, folic acid in their flour. Even men get it. So I'm not really cool with all that stuff. I kind of like to have food just be plain food and then make sure I eat 
what I need. Okay? So you don't need to buy iodinized salt. I don't buy it. I buy sea salt and I think it tastes better too. Next, the functions of um, the thyro thyroxine and triiodothyronine are to increase the resting metabolic rate, um, turn on heat production in your body so you warm up, heart rate goes up, growth goes up, and it turns off TSH when the levels are high. So that was our negative feedback story. Okay, here's your group question. Uh, without using your book, predict the symptoms of a patient who has hypothyroidism and then hyper... wait, what did I just say? Hypo... did I say it right? Hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. And then, how could these diseases be detected and what might be the treatment for them? Okay, so don't use your book. See what you can, what you can predict about them already. Okay? Turn off the show, pause it, and take a minute. Okay, the person, hypo means, means low, right? So they have hypothyroidism. They don't have enough of those hormones. So what would you expect their heart rate going back? Heart rate would be low. Heat would be low, growth would be low, metabolic rate would be low, right? All of them low. They would um, feel sluggish, tired, they'd want to nap a lot, wouldn't have energy. They, what about their weight? They would probably be overweight, right? Because they have a low metabolic rate. And how would you check for this? How would you know if someone had this? That's it. A blood test. Easy. You can have it checked. I'll go to who specializes in all of this? Who specializes in hormones? What's their name? It's called an endocrinologist, right? So someone who would have hypothyroidism would have to take that a lot of people take um oh shoot. I can't remember. Synth synthroitin or something like that. There's there's um, synthetic, and then there's um, bio, biologic, bio, I don't know, bioidentical hormones, I think they might call them. Different kinds of hormones that people could take for this. But the problem with like, any of this is, you know, when you take a drug, it's just a band-aid, right? It doesn't really fix the problem. So taking the drug will give them the hormones they need, but, like, why is it not working in the first place? So that takes a lot more work, a change in lifestyle, diet, and all that stuff. Hyperthyroid would be just the opposite. What would their resting metabolic rate be? High heat production, high heart rate, high, right? So this um, hyperthyroid, the person would be hot, they'd be thin, they eat a lot, and it's actually um, very dangerous to have hyperthyroidism as it is hypothyroidism. And this is the one that you can sometimes tell people are hyperthyroid because their eyes kind of bulge a little bit. Um, I met somebody recently for the first time and her eyes were bulging a little bit. And I was like, oh, I know her story. And of course she was thin. And um, later she was talking to me about her hyperthyroidism. And I thought, yep, I already knew that just from looking at her. So this, uh, there was a story many years ago when the Olympics were in Los Angeles Jackie Joyner Kersey was her name and she was um, a Olympic athlete superstar with hyperthyroidism excellent shape she was famous for her long fingernails she had when she would run um, she was a sprinter she would run a race you know she'd get down on the ground on on her fingernails she would hold onto the ground and then she'd take off and she would go around the country after winning her gold medals and speaking about the dangers of hyperthyroidism. And tragically, she died from it. And she was only like 48 years old, healthy, athlete, um, and, but it's, it puts a lot of strain on the heart. Okay, so hyperthyroidism, just because they're skinny doesn't mean it's healthy, right? Got it. Calcitonin. Production made by the C cells 
of the thyroid. So we just did follicular cells. Now we have C cells. C cells of the thyroid. Um, you should know that if you haven't seen that. I'm making a note here. I have to write something down with it. C cells. Gotta write that. Um, the function is to inhibit the osteoclasts and stimulate the kidneys to release calcium. So that means release meaning into the urine. So blood calciums, uh, blood calciums, blood calcium levels decrease. Okay. Sorry, I'm still making it out. Okay, got it. Second, opposite. Always a pair, kind of, huh? Right? So if one makes the calcium go down, the other makes the calcium go up. So if calcium drops the parathyroid glands, which are on the back of the thyroid, there's like little, maybe eight to ten of them or something, um, makes parathyroid hormone, tells the kidneys and the bone to bring calcium into the blood. And of course, this is a negative feedback loop. Okay, so there's less leaving now. So just the opposite of calcitonin. Parathyroid hormone produced by the parathyroid gland stimulates the osteoclasts, so blood calcium levels increase. Is that it? Next, pancreas. Now we're going to talk about the pancreas and the digestive system in a few weeks. Um, for now, we're going to focus on the islets, the pancreatic islets. So we have the beta cells and the alpha cells that we're interested in. The glucagon, made by the alpha cells of the islets, increases blood glucose levels and takes glucose out of storage. Okay, got that one. Opposite, insulin. Who makes it? The beta cells. And this will decrease blood glucose levels, stimulate glucose transporters, right? So we have those transporters there. We need to insert them into the membrane, plasma membrane, so that they can start transporting. It's also going to signal glycogenesis, the making of glycogen, triglyceride storage, and protein synthesis. So tell me again, which one is made? after you eat a meal, glucagon or insulin? Insulin, right. When you're hungry, glucagon. Got it. This takes us to the story of diabetes. We talk about diabetes a couple times in, a couple times in the class, yeah. At least. The first one um, is called type 1 diabetes mellitus. Say diabetes mellitus. Type 1 is an autoimmune destruction of beta cells. So we have several different kinds of uh, autoimmune diseases that people get. We don't know why. All of a sudden the body decides to freak out and we've talked about multiple sclerosis this way, right? With MS, the body was fighting the myelin. With um, diabetes type 1, it's fighting the beta cells. Can you believe that? It just says, hey, you, beta cell, attack. And it attacks its own beta cells. These people, therefore, do not make insulin. They have to have insulin shots, and they are called insulin-dependent diabetics. It is often diagnosed in children. So if you see a child with, with diabetes, it's not because they're fat and overweight and not eating right. It's because they are, their body is going to destroy its own beta cells. It's usually diagnosed, like, um, I'd say, you know, junior high, even grade school. In grade school, kids will have symptoms and they'll, you know, not feel well and all these things. They'll do a, all you do is a blood test. And you see blood sugar is high, and they live with it for their entire lives. Okay, they have to check their blood every day, and they they have to take insulin shots, and it's it's just part of their life. Um, people now getting older. 30s, 20s are being diagnosed with type 1 and it's kind of got people stumped because usually it's a childhood diagnosis, not someone who's 28, 35, 38, something like that. Um, but more and more commonly, someone's coming in as a diabetic, uh, as an adult, and it's type 1 and it's confusing people because usually it's type 2. All right. Type 2, most common. Um, is reduced sensitivity of insulin receptors. This person is non-insulin dependent, so no matter how much insulin you give them, it uh, doesn't it doesn't work. The insulin does not bind to its receptors. Typically, this is going to be due to someone um, having poor diet, poor health, 
uh, being overweight is a big, having too much adipose tissue is the big key to this. This is totally reversible. Type 2 diabetes, it will take you, uh, not you, it will take a person a year or two to do it, to lose the weight, change their life, but it is totally possible. So if you know anyone with type 2, they can do it. Most people take a drug called uh, metformin to help control sugars for type 2 uh, diabetes. Okay, melatonin story. This is your circadian rhythms, your biological clock. Are you a morning person? Are you a night person? The melatonin is needed from the pineal gland. Here's the picture of it for sleep. Have you ever taken melatonin? Some people take it to sleep better. Take it before they sleep. So melatonin has um, is um, has different times of the day that it peaks and and it's for sleeping. Okay, so melatonin. If you go on a trip somewhere to, the, say, China, your whole biological clock gets messed up because you're in a different time zone, right? So to help fix that, it's important that if you travel, when you go someplace, you get outside and you get sunlight into your eyes because this is the stimulation, okay? The light coming in, um, fixes or the night, the day, whatever it happens to be. You cannot stay inside. So if you're just staying inside at a hotel or a conference or something, you're not going to get um, your biological clock fixed that way. Okay. Plus you can never really fix it. It takes about three weeks to get your melatonin back to normal. So by the time you get someplace, just enjoy your vacation and come on, come home again. So the pineal gland produces melatonin for the day or night day cycles. Uh, called circadian rhythms and this all comes from the amino acid tryptophan. Tryptophan is the one found in Turkey Thanksgiving time. Um, it's converted to serotonin um, and that is converted into melatonin, a pineal gland hormone. Almost done. Thymus. You don't really have very much of a thymus when you are an adult. It's much larger in a child. But thymus does make a hormone called thymopoietin, which encourages the stem cells of the bone marrow to become T cells. So we'll talk more about that in the lymphatic system. But do you know T cells? T cells, yeah. T cells are the ones that are um, famous for HIV, attacking the helper T cells. And the last two are in the gonads. That's the ovaries making um, estrogen from the follicular cells, and estrogens produce female like characteristics. Testes have interstitial cells to produce testosterone and testosterone produces male characteristics. Okay? So here's a question I want you to spend some time on. It um, is a question about these two people who get together for, for breakfast. So it says this morning at 8 a.m. Martin and his friend Andrea went out to breakfast. Martin had a cup of coffee but Andrea knows the importance of a good breakfast she ate yogurt, pancakes, fresh fruit, and a hot chocolate. So the point of all this is to have Martin have nothing. His cup of coffee is just black, plain coffee. Okay, so he's not eating. He hasn't eaten since dinner. And that Andrea has all the, the important food. Okay, that's why I made this. I make this stuff up, right? Um, number one, of the hormones introduced today, would they be increasing or decreasing their action in Martin's body after breakfast and tell me why? And would they be increasing or decreasing their action in Andrea's body after breakfast and tell me why? So what I'm going to do is show you the list of all of the hormones that you need to know from today. And then and I, and you need to copy it down. After you think about it, I want you to write like an up arrow. Is, is it going up in Andrea? or is it going down or you can just do a dash so if you don't think that the breakfast is changing any uh, uh, changing a hormone you just put a dash in the box okay just a straight line okay this will take you at least 10 minutes to do if you want to do it properly okay and then um, so pause the show write these down fill it out and then I'll go through it with you Okay, first is ADH, antidiuretic hormone. So Andrea had lots of um, 
water. Martin, pretty much not. I mean, he had a cup of coffee. That doesn't really count. So, who needs antidiuretic? Who needs to save, right, because antidiuretic saves water, right? Save it in your blood. Who needs that, Andrea or Martin? Martin does, right? Let me find my, let me find my pen. Let's see, pointer, screen, felt tip pen. So let's do the pen, let's see if we can get it. Martin needs... Um, anti-diuretic hormone. So let's put an up arrow here. And Andrea has plenty of fluid, right? So she does not need to keep water. She can let it go. So her levels are going to be low. Mm -hmm. Did you get that right? Pretty much what I want is the, a story here where one goes up, one goes down. Okay. Anti-diuretic hormone. Got it. Oxytocin. Is anybody having a baby? No. So we'll just put a dash. TSH stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. Okay, so who has lots of metabolism right now? Who can have lots of uh, increased metabolism, heart rate? All, who can have all that go up? Who is healthy and feeling good? Building, right? Andrea is. So her TSH levels are high. And by the way, this goes where? Where's, where does TSH have its action? At the thyroid gland, right? So therefore, we might as well go down and do T3 and T4. If she is eating, she can build, she's got good times, we're going to give her an up here too. Okay? Whereas Martin cannot have a high me metabolism right now. His heart rate is not going to be able to be high because he's tired. He's drinking coffee, which just has caffeine, which is artificially making his heart rate go up. So let's give him a down. Okay? TSH down, which also means then that the T3, T4 is not going to be released. Okay? Adrenocorticotropic hormone, next one, ACTH, tells the adrenal glands. Where's the adrenal glands here? Here's the adrenal glands. We have a list of, of corticoid and epinephrine. So, let's see, adrenocorticotropic tells the adrenal glands to release cortisol, epinephrine. This is, this is, uh, who's stressed right now? Andrea, Andrea, however you want to say her name, Andrea or Martin. Who is stressed out? The person eating or the person not eating? The person not eating is stressed. His epinephrine is high because he is tired. He's not eating. His cortisol levels are high. And so we can go back to his ACTH and say, well, geez, if those others are up, then this must be up to make those go up. Okay. Whereas Andrea, she's doing rest and digest, right? And she's eating. She doesn't need epinephrine, so hers are low. And her corticosteroids, low, right? She doesn't, she's not stressed, no inflammation, okay? ACTH, therefore, is low for her, okay? LH and FSH, those are um, hormones that stimulate the ovaries and the S, um, Testes, are they changing with breakfast? Nope. So let's go over here to the list because these are estrogens and testosterone. Also from the ovaries, not changing, not changing. Of course, he doesn't even have any ovaries. Thank you. Growth hormone. All right. So these are adults getting together. I don't know. You can have a little bit. Okay. Who would have a little bit of growth hormone right now? And it wouldn't be much, but it would be Andrea, right? And Bob Martin's would be low. Prolactin. Anybody nursing? No. Calcitonin. Decreases calcium. Decreases blood calcium. Who can decrease blood calcium right now? Who has plenty? Andrea does. So she can uh, decrease blood calcium. Martin cannot. And then PTH just works the opposite way, right? In it increases blood calcium. She doesn't need it. He does. So these just go as a pair. Same with glucagon and insulin. So tell me again, after you eat, which one is highest? Insulin, so that's Andrea. So she's up for insulin, down for glucagon. And Martin? Just the opposite, right? He needs to pull sugar out of storage, so he's going to increase his glucagon. 
and he's going to decrease his insulin. Does breakfast change melatonin? Not really. It will be changing at that time, but not because of that. And does breakfast change thymopoietin, the making of T cells? No, not really. All right. How do you feel? You feel good, right? Time to get started. Going to start memorizing these things. I know the exam's not for a little bit, but you got to get these into your long term memory, okay, and then pull them back out again right before the test. All right, we are done. Good job.